On today's show, the Suns are going in the right direction. What are they doing right so far? What do we think about their trade? And the Bucks are going in the wrong direction. They also made a trade. What do we think about them? And we'll do some buyout matching on today's Locked On NBA. Let's go. You are Locked On NBA, your daily NBA podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome. You are locked on to the NBA. My name is Nick Engstead, host of the Locked On Mavericks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for being part of the show, making Locked On NBA your first and probably second listen of the day. We did a trade deadline reaction show, me and Wes Goldberg. So listen to that if you want to hear about the big moves that got made. Tony East and I will talk about the rest of them today. Joining me on a Thursday night going into Friday. What you got for me, Tony East? I had to cover three trades. I got to watch Dev Curry score 42 points. Now I get to talk about some other games. What a day. This it's a pretty good day. It's a pretty about. good day. It was a good day. day. I love this. It's a holiday. I mark it on my calendar. Feel- <laughs> I love it. It's the best. The players get election day off. We should get the day after the trade deadline off. I think that's only. Fun. I am taking it off. I'm not doing anything <laughs> tomorrow. Tell David Locke. I don't, I don't care. I'm not doing anything. Actually, that's not true. I'm recording a podcast. <laughs> Aren't we all? It's a sickness. It's a sickness that I have here. We're five days a week. We're daily over here on Locked On. We'll talk about the trades. We'll talk about all the trades that Wes and I didn't talk about earlier today. So we'll talk about like the Jazz Kelly Olynyk trade. We'll talk about the Dennis Schroeder, Spencer Dinwiddie swap and like where Dinwiddie goes in a buyout. We'll talk about that. He was at the Mavs game at, in MSG, which is weird. So we'll talk about that. Uh, and then we'll also do some buyout matching. I got a list of names. I'm going to throw them at Tony. And he's going to tell me the best team that should, should sign them. And we'll figure out who can sign them and who can't. We'll talk about the Bucks. They're 11 and 11 since Christmas. They lose tonight in a big way against the Timberwolves. So we'll talk about what's going wrong with them. Well, let's start here, Tony East. The Phoenix Suns get a win, a convincing win against the Jazz tonight. They win 129 to 115. No Devin Booker, but Kevin Durant has 31 points, eight boards, seven assists. They're 17 and six since Christmas. No other team has more wins. The Cavs also have 17, but nobody else has more wins since Christmas. They're the number two offense in the NBA since Christmas, the number nine defense since Christmas. Tony East, what are they doing right? Uh, They're healthy. (laughs) That's That's not the only answer, but that's a big part of it. You know, you can just look at their box score tonight and see that Bradley Beal had 30 points. And, you know, I watched the Pacers play them in Phoenix. And Beal was the closer, and Booker was the opener, and Kevin Durant was Kevin Durant. Like, <laughs> when they're all clicking like this and they have time to get synergy, play together, look like a better team, that's obviously been a big part of it. But I think that, not only does it have, like, your three-headed monster is playing, now all these minimum guys that you signed to play smaller roles are playing smaller roles and not an elevated role where they need to do too much or just in general are out of their comfort zone playing which sometimes can be fine but hasn't been for the Suns so like Grayson Allen has settled in and been such a good shooter that it's like a big deal he's not in the three-point contest and like Eric Gordon was amazing tonight like Drew Eubanks is playing better Josh Okoji's playing well for them all this stuff's happening to the extent that they're like let's get better I liked what they did today we'll talk about that but yeah. I think it really is health and in particular with Beal like he came out a little slow but he's been really great like the last month or so and that's huge for the Suns they look like a contender again Games missed since Christmas, this 17 and six run that we're talking about. Booker missed one. That was tonight. The only one. <laughs> Durant has missed three. That's that's a ton for, for this group. Uh, Beal has missed one since Christmas. That's a big one because they were missing him a lot at the beginning. Nurkic also has only missed one. Like they yeah. these they've been really healthy in this streak. The health has been a real big deal. The other thing, though, is you add Booker, Durant, and Bradley Beal together. What do you think? Oh, I've got three of the best shooters in the NBA. And that's exactly what this team has been. They are insanely good as a shooting team. You go to cleaning the glass and you go to their box score and you go to like their effective field goal percentage since Christmas and you go through it. They've had one below average game shooting the ball, like effective field goal percentage. And that was a loss to Memphis. That was just like a random night. And they still shot like 49% effective field goal, which is the 17th percentile, which is really bad. So it's just like one really off night they've had shooting the ball since Christmas. This team since Christmas is shooting... 54 40 78 as a team from field goal three point and free throw it's just insane like this team just shoots the ball really well because they have those three guys they demand so much attention and they also just shoot the ball really well themselves in general like i don't know if it's sustainable shooting this well like how well this whole team has been shooting but if it, if anybody's going to do it it's going to be these three guys yeah and they added more talent today which could help <laughs> sustain these percentages i saw them in indy and booker had 62 that night and the Pacers won, but 
it's because Kevin Durant and Bradley Beal were just off because like when Booker's playing like that, you think, oh, we could trap him. Let's get the ball out of his hands. And then it's like Bradley Beal or Kevin Durant is <laughs> wide open. Like that's a better option <laughs> some nights against the Suns. It's just insane how good they can be. And now they have the guy whose nickname is Big Body on their team. Oh, yeah. Among other things. I mean, they, they had a pretty good day today to me. Their trades today. They made in they made a three team trade. Thank you for making it a three team and not like two separate ones. <laughs> Phoenix, I appreciate that. Uh they acquired Royce O'Neal from the Nets and David Big Body Roddy, like you said, from the Memphis Grizzlies. They send out Kata Bates Jop, who was everybody uh, every NBA media person's darling signing that they that they got. I the would like season. credit for never pimping that. You, you didn't buy into it? You didn't buy into no, Kata Bates no. Jop. Uh Kata Bates Jop was sent out. Chemezi Metu. Yuta Wananabe and Jordan Goodwin and three second round picks. So they took all the guys that they like randomly signed that didn't really work for them. A couple of seconds, sent them out for Royce O'Neal, David Roddy. What do you think about the deal? Yeah, they, this is barely legal salary wise, right? Like that's what the Suns could. <laughs> that sounded weird, didn't it? That's all the Suns could do with their salaries was something like this. So to get a player like O'Neal who makes that much money and they have his bird rights is significant for their future maneuvers. And he's good, right? He's a wing sized dude who can defend just good enough and fitting the theme we just talked about, he makes threes, right? That is important yeah. to their team. He's going to fit in extremely well off the bench. Like they played Bull Bull and Nasir Little tonight as their seventh and eighth guys. Like he's better than both of those guys. And he doesn't play the same position as Bull, obviously, but he's better than Little. That certainly helps. And Roddy, a former first round pick, maybe he doesn't turn into anything for them, but they just need any bites at like the young Apple. This guy could be something that's the same kind of deal with Little they got. What? You know the one the one thing about David Roddy that like as somebody that covers the Mavericks and cares if they, win, if they win or lose, Roddy destroys the Mavericks. <laughs> this is like if you're a Suns fan and you're like, I don't know what to think about David Roddy. He's at literally go look at his two best games of his career. It's like he scored 18 points and like 15 points. They're all against the Mavericks. He like just he destroys them. Yeah, he hasn't like been awesome in the pros, right? No. Like some people were surprised they got any value for him in Memphis. So I don't know what he's going to do for the Suns, but they got better, certainly, because O'Neal's good. And they got, one, a player they can re-sign, which for them is very important given their apron situations, and two, a player who could become better at basketball, which, again, is significant yeah. for them. So I think they get a pretty good day. What they did, I think, is they added physicality with him because he's yes. like, you call him big body, but like, but like, yeah, you you bring in physicality with him and Royce O'Neal, so then it gives you different looks. This Suns team kind of has one look, but then they want to go to that K, KD at five look. You know, that kind of a lineup. And so when you do that, you need a four or a three or somebody else around that can body guys around and push them around and get some rebounds because they're just going to really struggle rebounding the ball if they don't do that. And I think Roddy could do that. I don't know if he'll stay on the floor long enough for them to be able to do it, but they at least get a different look where you can throw Bull Bull and, and Roddy together and like <laughs> or, or KD together. And it looks like just every henchman of every like like kids movie with just like the, the string bean guy, then the, like, the short round guy. Yeah, it's not that they've like desperately needed depth all year because when they were unhealthy, guys were just overtaxed. But like yeah. Royce O'Neal can play 25 minutes in a game with or without stars and be a fine player. And David Roddy has played on good and bad teams and kind of understands what to do. And like, again, he's not great, but like it's just guys who know what they're doing are going to mean something for the Suns who had to you know play their two A guys tonight. Right. Like it, it, they just needed good players <laughs> and. I they, get, yeah. they got him. You're about to say something. No, I have one more stat on the on the Suns here that I, I yes. thought was wild. I love this Suns team. I'm curious how they look in in the into the playoffs and in the future because they they follow the same formula as the past Suns that have had problems. They take the 25th most amount of shots at the rim, so they don't take any shots at the rim. Yeah. But they shoot seven. Like they're seventh in percentile, so they shoot really well at the rim when they get there. They're second in mid-range shots taken at the rim. 35% of their shots come at the mid-range, but they're ninth in percentage. So they're really good at going at shooting mid-range shots, and they take a ton of them. They're 23rd the amount of threes that they take, too, but they're fourth in percentage. So they're like a really good shooting team, but don't take any shots at the rim, don't take any threes, and they take a ton of mid-range shots. I'm just curious what that shot appetite looks like going into the playoffs because they're doing it again. Like They're just the same team, basically. I agree, and they take for lack of a better term, the right kind of mid-rangers, like they're <laughs> self-created. They're not like assisting or like drawing up plays for mid-range shots. It's just like Beal Booker and KD can get to the shots they like there, which is why their percentage is good. Those guys are good play finishers. But yeah, they like one of them has an off night from an inefficient spot. 
that's bad. That's a big deal in the playoffs, right? So you'd like to maximize that efficiency. Nurkic has never really been a good finisher around the rim, right? So like they need to try their best to put as much pressure on that as they can. I don't know if these moves necessarily will help them at the rim, uh, oh, but O'Neal makes, will make makes these three. problems worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, O'Neal could help the three point part of it. Like that's, I think he's at like 80% three point attempt rate this season. Like oh, yeah, six just, uh, of his seven shots per game are threes. So maybe he'll help there. But in general, I agree with you that that is maybe, maybe not a problem because they have such good scores, but just like something they need to think about. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no, it's like, I've got my eye on it. I'm just like, I'm looking yeah. at it. Like, I don't know if it's going to be an issue, but I'm it has been, the, it has been in the past. That's right. Coming up. Talk about an issue. The the Milwaukee Bucks are 11 and 11 since Christmas. They've already changed their coach. They can't do that. What else can they do? What can they fix? We'll talk about that and more coming up. But before I do that, let me tell you about eBay Motors. Our partners at eBay Motors have teamed up with the GOAT. The GOAT, Josh Lloyd of Fantasy Basketball, to bring you some of the best fantasy picks each week all season long, whether you're prepping for your daily draft or scouring the, the waiver wire. Josh Lloyd gives you eBay's guaranteed fit fantasy picks of the week. Tony. One of the picks this week is your boy, Benedict Matherin. He says, Buddy Heald is now in Philadelphia. So that should mean more minutes for Matherin. What do you think about Matherin as a pickup for eBay's Fantasy Picks of the Week? I think he'll play a little more. <laughs> Maybe not quite a lot more, but I agree that he's going to, when he is playing a little bit more, get the ball more with the Pacers' second unit. He's going to be the Russian to a bigger role. I think that's a smart pick from Josh Ben Matherin. Uh, much more important for the Pacers now. Josh Lloyd from Lockdown Fantasy Basketball is going to help you win your fantasy championship. And eBay Motors knows a championship team is about each player being a perfect fit. Like we were talking about some of the trades earlier. Same with your vehicle. So check out eBay Motors. I know that Lockdown Pelicans host Jake Madison uses eBay Motors all the time to fix up his cars. He's always buying parts. I went to his house and he had eBay Motors like packaging from parts that he was getting and like getting mailed to him all over. Uh, he hadn't cleaned them up. So with over 122 million parts to choose from, you know that those parts are going to fit you exactly right with the eBay's guaranteed fit. They're going to fit your ride or die every time, the first time, or your money back. Plus, these prices, you're burning rubber and not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions, they do apply. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us on Locked On NBA. Being part of the show, being an everydayer, listening every day, we have a daily Locked On show that covers your team. Check the link in the description to find a show that covers your team every day. Sometimes, multiple times a day. <laughs> Two Locked On Mavs today. Well, your of, team's the Pacers. Games. Multiple Locked On Pacers today. There you well. go. Multiple Locked On Pacers. I know multiple bunch of other shows. So go check them out. And, Tony, let's get into the Milwaukee Bucks. They lose... A game tonight against the Minnesota Timberwolves. Just an ugly, ugly, not not good looking box score for, for the Ooh. for the Bucks. They only score 105 points. They get outscored by 25 or 24. Uh, they had a 28 point deficit at one point. They were close at halftime, and then it just they just blew the doors off of them. The Timberwolves did. The Bucks since Christmas are 11 and 11. They're the 12th best offense, the 24th defense. What's going wrong with the Bucks right now? Well, boy, am I qualified to talk about Bucks losses because, man, did the Pacers hand them a bunch of <laughs> That's them <right. laughs> this season. I can't even explain this. Like, I'm a numbers guy. I'm all about stats. I like to be able to have data and, like, points and reason to explain what I'm thinking. The Bucks have no oomph. That's not, a, that's not a term that means something, but just, like, Giannis is amazing. Every single game, you're like, crap. What are we going to do to slow down Giannis? Are we going to form a wall here? Are we going to cut off this play here? How are we going to guard when he sets a screen, when he has a ball? Everyone else, you're kind of like, especially because Dame hasn't been as good this year in like every basically stat. You're kind of like, yeah. meh, whatever, right? Like half of playing the Bucks now is like, well, if we overload this action, we just hope Brooke Lopez doesn't beat us. And then he doesn't. <laughs> you know, Malik Beasley was one for 13 in this game. Like you live with that, obviously, right? And so he's a three-point guy test. He's a good shooter, but just... The, the stuff that you're willing to live with against the Bucs has been, like, okay to live with for a lot of the season, if that makes sense. The Pacers formed a three-person wall against Giannis earlier this month. Giannis has seen that coverage a lot, but, like, he naturally calls himself a passer. He wants to distribute when he sees that wall, and no one else has been consistent enough at punishing that kind of stuff for the Bucs this year. Giannis has been amazing. So they just have no oomph. They need someone else to give them, like, a, uh-oh, you know, and, and that should have been Dame, but it hasn't been. That's not to say Dame's been bad, but, like, I think everybody thought Dan would be a little better than this for them. It's interesting watching this team and thinking about what they were and what they're trying to be. They've usually been 
a good defensive team that just makes it work an, with enough on offense. What was the thing two years ago? They need another scorer. They need another like guy that can just get a bucket because they've got enough defense. They just don't have enough bucket getters because Middleton you know, was hurting here and there. The thing is, though, they get Damian Lillard, and then all of a sudden this team turns into – We've got to outscore everybody and just changing your DNA so drastically like that. Like it seemed like they have won enough games. So now they're in a a good spot, but their coach is gone for a reason, right? Like that, that oomph that you're talking about, he's like, they completely changed their DNA. And so when you need to just dominate on offense uh, and they, they pivoted to offense, like, like past like media markets, like media outlets have pivoted to video. They pivoted to offense basically this season. (laughs) And the whole league pivoted to offense too. It's like the whole league caught up with with what they're doing. 118 points per 100 possessions is their offensive rating since Christmas. That's 12th in the league. That used to be the best mark in NBA history, like two years ago, like not that long ago. It's wild that they they did this pivot. Like you, if you're gonna pivot to to offense, the Mavs are struggling with this too, a lot because of injuries. If you're gonna pivot to like being a really good offensive team that just makes it good enough with defense you've got to be an elite offensive team and have every option and have every angle and you cover a team like that that just has all kinds of different shooters everywhere (laughs) and options and they're they're doing it they pivoted to offense completely and it's working but for the bucks it just hasn't so far yeah i agree with that 100 percent. and like it's funny because every team who does it even if it is succeeding like the pacers this season have been like yeah we we still got to defend a lot better right so like yes the the bucks need to be better offensively that's going to be their thing but like their defense has been so terrible so for dame i have a couple things for dame specifically like his efficiency is fine it's a you know 60 percent is good but like maybe not exactly what he wants his usage is fine for them he doesn't turn it over that much the key stat that's way down from from prior seasons is his assist rate right like Mm. they're not asking him to create as much which makes sense Giannis is on his team has the ball but like i mean dame doesn't have it as much that means dame's not as threatening all the time his per 36 scoring is its lowest it's been since 2015-16. The only season it was lower than this was the season he got hurt with that abdominal thing and only played like 25 games, right? So, like, mm. in general, I get that he's been efficient enough, and maybe I'm overthinking this, under 35% well, from three, though. Like, they just need him to be a little better, right? And that's a little lazy to say, but they just need him to be better. Tonight, specifically, <laughs> they played the Timberwolves. If the, the Timberwolves want to play the slowest, most annoying, hard-to-score game of all time... <laughs> They got it. The Bucs had no answer for that, right? They shot 42.4% from three in this game, almost made half their shots, only turned it over 13 times, and got smoked. They had no chance. And, yeah, Minnesota made a bunch of threes, but, like, if you're going to be an offensive identity team, you can't lose that kind of game where you shoot pretty well. So they just have a lot of signals that are, like, something's missing from a connectivity perspective, and maybe it's just Dame because Drew made their old identity so great. Maybe it's the role players aren't consistent enough. I don't know. But no one, like, no one is fearing the Bucs right now, even if I think they'll probably win their first-round series. Like, no one's afraid of that team right now, I think. Yeah. Well, we thought that they would definitely win a first-round series last year, and they did not. So. <laughs> I did. I picked them in four, I think. In that series. Uh, I'll go even lazier with the Damian Lillard thing. Since Christmas, the slump that we're talking about, Damian Lillard, shooting splits, field goal, three-point oh, and boy. free throw, 41%, 30%, 92%. I mean, just not good shooting i mean ball. like like here's how bad that is i wonder if he's hurt that's so low you know what i mean like yeah like right. his track record's insane that's just wild but they did address their offense by getting wait wait they didn't address their offense no but they they addressed they the sh- things that we're talking about like the mentality they of address their defense yeah. they're like all right we don't have a defensive mentality at all <laughs> let's bring in somebody that only has a defensive mentality because he gets <laughs> defensive about everything oh wait no because he's a good defensive player right <laughs> They bring in Patrick Beverly. They trade Cameron Payne and a second round pick for him. Your thoughts on Patrick Beverly and then the Dame connection now with him is is fascinating. (laughs) Yeah, I'm not like super caught up on NBA beef. I'll try to talk about that. (laughs) In terms of basketball fit, I think Patrick Beverly is a much better fit for the Bucs than Cam Payne was. Like they were so desperate for backup point guard play after the moves they made this summer. They were psyched about Cam Payne. But if they're (laughs) going to do what they're doing, like let's score a lot and not defend very well. (laughs) Well, you're not scoring enough then a player like that who also has had a kind of a down year doesn't help you very much whereas Patrick Beverly who has shot it okay like he almost has become him and Aaron Holiday have made this transition to me in the NBA where they're almost like a wing you know they like just shoot threes and defend twos and threes a lot Patrick well the three and D guard Javon yeah. Carter last year was that Javon Carter is definitely one of them and he was on the Bucks and was really important right. for them, right so he he almost helps them because he can not just be a backup point guard but like be that kind of versatile like would it would it surprise me at all if 
there's some nights he's closing at the two over Malik Beasley. No, no, not at all. I mean, it would require specific matchups because he's short, but I think that's that's a good addition for them. Even if it's a super small move, I think it's a good one. And uh, as for the beef, I mean, he already said it, right? Didn't he say, uh, Dame and I got <laughs> got to become but I forget exactly what it was. I saw him say something about it. If Rehashing Westbrook them. and Patrick Beverly can put it can put it behind them, then then Damian Lillard and, and did they Patrick they Beverly. traded Beverly pretty quickly off of that? Too. I don't know. Just, <laughs> he's beefing with everybody. It is what it is. Uh, they, look, they're I, afraid. I, I, I think this trade has nothing to do with the on court production oh. that Patrick Beverly is going to bring. Oh, I think you look at what happened to the Bulls last year, where the Bulls even even Pat the designer, who I do locked on NBA with on on Wednesday nights. Every week, every once in a while, we'll bring up, you've got to get that mentality guy. Like the, like you bring Patrick Beverly in and it changes the culture of like your team. Like the bulls are looking for that again, because they did kind of catch lightning in a bottle when they brought Patrick Beverly. They were good. It changed kind of their mentality a little bit. I think that doc rivers and the team just look at it and go, we just need one dog, like just one guy that is insane, that has a podcast, and that is just <laughs> nuts. And <laughs> has to have all three of those things. <laughs> Wasn't that supposed to be Thanasis? <laughs> <laughs> he is a guy with a podcast. He is. Nuts, <laughs> um, they, yeah, I think that's true. That from a mentality perspective, that could be significant. Look, the Pacers are obsessed with keeping James Johnson around for very similar reasons. So that is not <laughs> that surprised to me. That, yeah, the, Mavs, that, the Mavs tried that too. And that sounds work. like I'm making fun of the Pacers. No, they like they, they've signed him to six contracts in 18 months. Like they love having James Johnson on their team. Well, the Bucks also on. traded. You, you are Lopez. making fun of them, but you're also telling the truth. So. I know. Those, they, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whatever. He is valuable to them. They also traded Robin Lopez away. That means nothing in this conversation, I assume. I mean, he doesn't play yeah. that much. This what up the sad for Brooke. It's sad for Brooke. It is sad for Brooke. It's sad for me. I love watching Robin Lopez beef with mascots. I hope he lands on another team. Since they've split up the twins, the Mavs need to do the right thing to have twin <laughs> to put twin, twins together. They've got an open roster spot. Sign Marcus Morris, and then you'll have both of them. <laughs> Yes, Marcus Morris, probably All imminently right. available after. We don't have. Are we going to talk about the Marcus Morris trade by chance, or can I just throw this line in now since you just said his name? <laughs> okay, go ahead. I don't know. If He's back with the Spurs after he spurned them. Remember that they were going to oh, sign him to right. the MLE, and They're they buy he was him like, out. "Just kidding, gonna I'm going him. to the Knicks." They're going to buy him out. They should. They should be real sticklers in that buyout after that. <laughs> we're not giving you anything. <laughs> Just giving you the money you're owed and your guaranteed contract. Coming up, speaking of buyouts, we'll give we'll play a game of buyout matching, buyout market matching, and we'll talk about the other trades that we haven't talked about today on Locked on NBA. We'll get into that coming up. Today's episode is brought to you by Nissan. Nissan has you covered with all kinds of great SUVs. They've got great options for you. They have the 2024 Nissan Rogue. Perfect for city drives and great escape. So you can take it out wherever you need to go. Class exclusive Google built in is so you're always know that you have that. You don't have to connect your phone anymore. You got the Google assistant, Google maps, Google play store, all that kind of stuff built in. It's kind of annoying when you get in a car and you have to like reconnect your phone every time. And you have to, in my car, I have to hit a button every time. It's like, I have to accept it. My phone has to be unlocked. And if it's not, then it's impossible to connect it. So having that already is great. Built right into a 12.3 inch HD touchscreen. For the infotainment system. The 2024 Rogue is the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure. Also, check out the 2024 Nissan Armada. With It will change what you expect from a full-size SUV. Picture a rugged 4x4 that could seat up to eight people, probably animals too, in first-class luxury and style. Tow bigger and explore further in the 2024 Armada. Take the Nissan Rogue, the Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada and go where your next big adventure is. Shop NissanUSA.com. That's NissanUSA.com. All right, Tony, let's talk about some of the trades we didn't get to earlier today. It's trade deadline day. And I know it's trade deadline day because this is the fourth podcast I've listened, I've done today. If you've listened to all four podcasts, you're probably an insane. Listen to or recorded? Did I say listen to? You it's, did. It's how long this day has been. Uh, this is the <laughs> you fourth do one. Listen I, to the podcast as you're recording, I believe. My fiance always says that she's the biggest fan of Locked On Pacers because she hears it before <laughs> anyone else on the planet it's every pretty, time. It's a pretty good point. It's a pretty good point <laughs> by her. Uh, well, let's talk about some of the trades. So we haven't really talked about the, what the Jazz did today. The Jazz send out Kelly Olynyk. They send out uh, Oche Ogbaji. Yesterday, or the day before, they sent out Simone Fontecchio. They get a first-round pick. They get another second-round pick from the Pistons that is almost a first-round pick. What did you think about overall what the Jazz did today? Basically selling off some guys. I like it. 
I like it. Um, they are they are smart about this in a way that's kind of hard, right? If mm. you're a team that's like in the play-in range, it's really hard to be like, you know what? Let's trade two rotation players away. Let's get worse. You Ooh, know, it's yeah. hard. And the, to do that, the anti bulls. Yes, the anti bulls. But the the other thing is, the bulls are descending. The Jazz are ascending. They're going up, and they wow. still are like, we're good. We've got a plan. We clearly want to value our cap space next summer. Let's get two top thirty five picks. We like Fantecchio. He's going to be a free agent. We like Olenek. He's going to be a free agent. Let's just get the good picks. That's hard to do. Takes a lot of stones, but Danny Ainge is certainly certainly not afraid of of doing that. So yeah, I think they got good value. Abaji might be something. So I think the Raptors did okay actually in this, especially if they keep Olenek. Like that could fit well for them. Scotty Barnes is an All Star. It's nice to build around him. But in general, for two players they could have theoretically lost in four or five months, I think the Jazz did really well in this deal. Yeah, it's one of those where I talked about the Mavs trades today on Locked On Mavs, and I was like, all right, here's the basketball of it. And then in the third segment, I was like, here's the assets of it all. Like, here's <laughs> the, the math of it. The Was this a good in a vacuum trade? And I think the the Jazz made a bad basketball trade, right? Like, it's not going to help them basketball-wise. It's going to make them worse. But they made a really good assets trade. Like, if you're trying to figure out the value of each thing, not a lot of first-round picks moved. David Locke made this point on Locked On Jazz that – not a lot of first round picks moved. The only ones that moved were the Mavs sent one to the Hornets, their own for PJ Washington. The Mavs acquired one from the Thunder to tr- send to the Wizards for Daniel Gafford. And then the, you know, the Jazz got one from the Raptors. So not a lot of first round picks moved. And Kelly Olynyk and OJ Abaji were not the best players mo- moved on trade oh. deadline. So for them to get a first in this is actually pretty good overall. In the aggregate. Well, so granted, it is guaranteed to be an awful first rounder. <laughs> like, it, it's either the Still, Clippers or Thunder. Got the one. Rounder, it's going to suck. But it's in the first round. That's <laughs> all that matters. They did get a first. <laughs> Trump. That's hard to do. The other thing that those, so the other thing the Raptors did, and we'll talk about the Raptors side of this, they swapped Dennis Schroeder for Den, Spencer Dinwiddie. They kind of did a thing, too, where they got worse because they're going to buy out Spencer Dinwiddie, it seems like. They basically just save money they're on the tax. they him out. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> so then uh, I don't know what the Raptors are doing. I guess they, they got Kelly Olynyk. They're obsessed with Canadians, so they get another Canadian in there. <laughs> I was worried about Dwight Powell there for a second, but he was going to get bought up. Uh, what do you think about what the Raptors are doing right now? This is the second year in a row where it's like, I get every move they made from a value perspective, but it's just kind of like, what? what's the plan? What are you hoping to do? Do you want to keep Kelly Olenek, but not Dennis Schroeder? You know, clearly they didn't want... It's just kind of... Now they can give the keys to quickly all the time, which is good. They should be doing that. And again, I like I like getting a Baji for them. I guess get all the Canadians. They didn't trade Bruce Brown. So like, what are yeah. they? what are they really looking for? from their team and the Masai is very opportunistic. I'll give him credit for that. He built the championship team. Like I think he's the right guy to lead them through whatever their next era is, but they just, there's two years in a row where I've kind of just gone like, huh, that's interesting <laughs> from a value perspective. This is, this one's fine. I mean, they, they got off money for next year, but they just trade, they basically traded Dennis Schroeder for nothing. Like that's never fun. Yeah. When they did the Kelly Olenek, OJ Baji deal, I was like, okay, I can kind of see it. In that, all right, let's just not be trash this year. <laughs> you know, like, let's not be... Yeah, they're gonna, they might lose their pick, right? So let's not, let's not be completely terrible this season and, like, be competent because these teams that have bottomed out recently, you know, the Pistons, for one, have, like, not recovered very well. The the, <laughs> the Rockets recovered pretty well for being t- as terrible as they were for a couple of years, but they have not. And so they do that. But then they trade away Dennis Schroeder, and it does, just doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. And so I'm, I'm curious what... Uh, what Sean Woodley says on Locked on Raptors. You can check out that. Let's play a game of buyout market matching. I've got a list of names, and you just tell me who you think is the best team to sign one of these players. Okay. Um, some of them are limited because they can't sign to certain teams, and I'll try oh, to remember geez. those off, off the top of my head. First one, the best the best guy on the market, I think, Spencer Dinwiddie. <laughs> Lakers. Lakers. Just Lakers definitely. all he was he was at the Mavericks game tonight. He was sitting behind the Mavs bench and he was talking to Mark Cuban. There's there's video evidence of him, but he's still going to the Lakers. Look, he kind of stunk this year, but like that was not a good situation <laughs> for him. Like he needed to do too much. You think he's coming back to the Mavs? Didn't that go terribly? No, they just traded him for Porzingis. 
Actually, he was okay for them. Or they just traded yeah. him. Uh, Lakers. They, they, they traded him for Kyrie. They, they wanted Bruce Brown. They need offensive juice so bad. I mean, like it. If Philly's going for Kyle Lowry, I'd probably rather have Spencer Dinwiddie than Kyle Lowry right now. But that seems like it's kind of well set. Minnesota got a point guard. Um, maybe the ah, the Bucks. The Bucks got Patrick Beverly. That would be a decent spot for Spencer Dinwiddie as well. There's a lot of teams that I'd be like, yeah, I get it. But I think Lakers and Sixers are the top two there. Bucks can't sign him because they're they're over the second. Apron. Gosh, dude, I'm not I'm not used so, to the aprons. It's so yeah. tough. This this is why it's hard, and it's only players that are making more than the mid level exception. Like it's a math problem to try and figure out these. Oh, I guys. see now. I see how I can figure out the apron thing. Sixers are also apron pilled. Yeah. So I picked the Lakers. I picked Suns can't do it either. Nuggets can't do it either. Like they're they couldn't get Kyle Lowry. Warriors, that's, Suns. That's my, that's my uh, other one. Bucks, Celtics, Heat. They're close heat. now. Heat. Yeah, Heat is also Heater also. Yeah, in that list, uh, Kyle Lowry is he just going to the Sixers? Can he? <laughs> sure, seems like it. They liked him a while ago, but yeah, can they? No, they got because they got under the tax today with the Daniel House trade, so they're definitely under the first apron. So yeah, that I mean, they were interested in him before, right? When the when the, the Raptors were trying to potentially trade him and then didn't. Uh, so that I mean, that makes sense to me. I don't I don't think he'll play that much for them, but at least he'll play. <laughs> you know, that wasn't. And really he's from happening. and he's from Philly, so it's like, yeah, um, that's true. And like his role went. Way down, like he got traded right after he got benched with the Heat, right? Like his role was dwindling yeah. pretty fast. At least the Sixers can offer him playing time. The last, the last couple names I want to talk about is this weird group of players that were just just shooters that got paid a bunch. Joe Harris, Evan Fournier, Davis Bertans, all probably going to get Furkan Korkmaz, all probably going to get bought out, and they're just like this class of shooters that the NBA freaked out about and just overpaid. Are these players useful in the NBA anymore? I think Bertans is okay still, uh, just as a shooter. I'll, I mean, all these guys are just all shooters. these guys. Is, yeah. Seth Curry, throw him in there too. Yeah, that's true. The Hornets definitely don't need him. Uh, okay, the Bulls are the first team I can think of that like, holy mm. cow, does that team need a guy who can shoot some threes? Magic, uh, they, Magic too are in there. The Magic are a team. The Magic, if they could get Seth Curry, that would be a great fit for them. Um, yeah, Chicago. I'm just trying to look at the list of teams. Do the Kings need another shooter? Maybe, maybe they could be a good Bertans team to me. Just soaking up a couple minutes. <laughs> hey guys. Hey guys, we couldn't get Kuzma, but guess who we got? <laughs> <laughs> Toughest Bertans. Yeah. Yes. If the Suns could get any of these guys, they would be wonderful fits there. Um, yeah, I think those are the ones that stand out the most, but I, like literally any contender adding a shooter, uh, this has been talked about a lot, and like I will equate this to a trade. I don't want. I'm, I might be doing too much on this point. The Celtics got Xavier Tillman, yeah, right. And the fully healthy Celtics in the playoffs, Xavier Tillman's never playing. <laughs> they have Porzingis and Al Horford. But if one of them gets hurt, you're like, yeah, we could play Xavier Tillman. That's fine. We're okay with that, right? Like at some of these with some of these buyout guys, maybe they'll play in the regular season. But when the playoffs come, that's what they're about. It's like. If you get an injury, you're not like freaking out all of a sudden about who you're going to play in your rotation. You have that guy ready. So, yeah, there's teams that need the shooters the most, the ones we just named. But really, any contender makes sense for the shooter type specifically to me. It's an interesting list. Some of the other names. Marcus Morris is another another name that, that could get bought out that we were talking about earlier with the, the Spurs unless they play hardball. <laughs> yes, two, two Marcus Morris references. <laughs> unless they play hardball with him. But the <laughs> what the Mavs should do is sign Spencer Dinwiddie on the buyout. And yeah, then Marcus. go to Marcus Morris and then and wave Markeith Morris to then sign Marcus. <laughs> Lordy. Would anyone know, right? That's their joke. Oh, just switch it up. Yeah, day. You just stay there. You stay there and get double the checks. Uh, there you go. Let us know who your team should sign in the buyout market. Let us know what you think about all these trades. Uh, Tony East has got you covered on Lockdown Pacers for more. And I have you on Lockdown Maps. Guys, thanks for listening to Lockdown NBA. Too much Marcus Morris today. <laughs> 